All right, welcome. And thank you for joining us. My name is Sarah Peterson. I am the science director for Wisconsin's Green Fire. And we're pleased to bring this event to you today. We are co-hosting this alongside Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, the Wisconsin chapter. And uh, we're gonna get going here right away. We have a very full program and a really exciting panel to introduce you to. So just a few logistical details. I'm sure everyone is well seasoned by now with Zoom. Um, this is what your screen will look like. At the bottom, you have the option to chat us with any technical issues that you may have. And we would like to reserve the Q&A function, the two little bubbles side by side, for any questions that you have for our panelists. So as we move along in the program, please feel free to use these functions. And then another thing to point out is the little box in the right here, you can view um, a speaker view, which is um, just gonna show you who's speaking at the moment. And there's also a gallery view to see the speakers side by side. Uh, so you can toggle and play with that as you like. Well, again, um, I'm going to briefly introduce Wisconsin's Green Fire. And we are all about supporting conservation, the conservation legacy of Wisconsin uh, by promoting science-based management of our natural resources. And our vision for this is to help citizens understand and support scientific and thoughtful long-term management. Uh, we were set up a little over three years ago uh, to ensure that this is happening in the state. Um, we have a very dedicated group of volunteers and members all across Wisconsin that are involved on various issue areas, including wildlife and uh, deer conservation, which we're talking about today. Briefly, uh, some of our goals with Wisconsin's Green Fire are to connect the public, media, and legislators to science. I know we have some um, staffers here on the call today. Welcome that uh, work with various members uh, in Madison. We also um, advocate for a healthy and protected Wisconsin. And we are very active in engaging the next generation of conservationists. We have a very active student and young professional work group happening. And we uh, support conservation here in the state and beyond. Um, you know, areas that we work in include um, helping to uh, promote and support the Knowles Nelson Stewardship Fund and many other initiatives and programs. A little bit about who we are. We are nonpartisan and independent, and we have a very diverse membership. Like I mentioned, people um, here today who have spent their careers with the Department of Natural Resources. We also have those that have spent um, many, many years in academia, and we focus on everything from water quality to wildlife to forestry and public trust issues. We have a growing board, or sorry, a growing staff, and we have an expert board of directors as part of our organization that help guide the organization and advise on our various issues. And <clears throat> like I mentioned, we have topical work groups that um, address these issues across the state, uh, including the wildlife work group, which you're gonna hear a little bit more about on today's call. And a big emphasis um, for today's program is our Opportunities Now issue paper around meeting Wisconsin's deer conservation challenges. And we're going to be highlighting some of the key recommendations for creating responsible management within the state and improving the uh, you know, management and conservation of white-tailed deer uh, in Wisconsin. So you're going to hear from our panel of experts um, uh, on the various aspects of this paper and also from our partner with Backcountry um, Hunters and Anglers. And so I'm going to now turn it over to Noah Wishow, who is going to introduce uh, his organization. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Um, I'm Noah Wishaw. I'm a uh, state co-chair for the Wisconsin uh, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. We're a public lands group. Um, we were founded out in Oregon. Uh, the headquarters is in Montana. Um, 
really it was found to founded to uh, to support public lands and make sure that there's access for everybody to those lands. But we expanded um, also into the science-based management um, portion of our wildlife to make sure that there is wildlife on those public lands for people to enjoy um, through hunting and fishing. So that's us in a nutshell. Our uh, email is there on the, on the PowerPoint for everybody to see if you want to get contact with us. Noah. We're uh, really excited to be partnering with BHA today on this program. So next I want to introduce Tom Haugi. Tom is the work, uh, work group chair for our wildlife work group and um, he is a former board member for WGF. He also has 37 years um, of experience as a wildlife biologist with the Department of Natural Resources as the Wildlife Management Program Director. He also serves on the board of the Wisconsin Wildlife Federation, and he's currently the president of Sauk County Conservation Alliance. So I'm going to turn it over to Tom, who's going to be co-moderating the session with me today, and he's going to tell you a little bit more about our Opportunities Now work and introduce our panelists. So I'll turn it over to Tom. Well, great, Sarah, uh, and thanks uh, for the introduction. Thought I'd throw a little video to get everybody in, in the mood. We're just three days um, before the start of the Wisconsin's gun deer season. And for most hunters uh, that are going out this week, I, I think they'd love to have an encounter like this at their, at their chosen deer stand. Wisconsin right now is, is buzzing as hunters are getting busy, uh, getting their gear in order and their hunting plans in order. About one third of our gun deer licenses are, are sold this, this week. So it's really kind of a exciting time. And all this activity demonstrates that deer are culturally very important uh, to our state. And I guess the truth is, is that deer have been very important since Wisconsin was first inhabited. They are an ecological keystone species, an important economic engine, and a cherished food source for many. Next slide, please. And today we're stepping back from all of that pre-hunt hubbub to take a look at the state of deer conservation in Wisconsin. Members of Wisconsin's Green Fire Wildlife Work Group have been assessing, or assessing the deer conservation landscape over the past two years and we published the issue paper shown here in June. Next slide. In this publication, we described in detail five major deer conservation challenges needing our attention. All of these challenges have been affecting deer conservation for some time and their combined impact is having a profound negative impact on the health of our forests and deer herds. And the question for all of us gathered today is, can we come together to step up our deer conservation efforts to a level that matches the importance of this wildlife resource to our state? Next slide. We are thrilled to have three of the authors of this document with us today as well as a chance to hear from a dedicated hunter's perspective on these challenges. So let's meet our speakers. You've already been introduced to Noah Wishaw at the start of this webinar. As Noah indicated, he's the state co-chair for Wisconsin Backcountry Hunters and Anglers after serving as the board's policy chair for two years. He's a native of Wisconsin and Noah's hunted and fished his whole life with whitetails being his main focus. Noah lives in Waterford with his wife and two kids. Keith McCaffrey began as a research biologist with the Forest Wildlife Research Group in the Wisconsin Conservation Department in 1963 and conducted deer and rough grouse habitat projects. Deer population harvest management soon became his focus. After serving as group leader, he retired in 2000 but continued as a full-time volunteer to DNR through 2020. Next slide. 
Don Waller is an author, plant ecologist, conservation biologist, and he applies his knowledge to improve forest and wildlife management. Don taught at the University of Wisconsin-Madison from 1978 to 2019, researching population dynamics, the demographic and genetic hazards, hazards of rarity and drivers of long-term ecological change, including the effects of habitat fragmentation, climate change, invasive species, and tropic cascades involving white-tailed deer. Mike Samuel is an emeritus professor in the Department of Forest and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He served as a wildlife research biologist with the U.S. Geological Survey for 30 years and professor of wildlife ecology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. His research interests are primarily in wildlife diseases with a focus on disease ecology and management, epidemiology, disease transmission and modeling, and wildlife population impacts. He has conducted research on chronic wasting disease in white-tailed deer in, Wisconsin, in the Midwest since 2002. Next slide. Our lead off panelist today is Keith McCaffrey. And Keith is going to start by helping us understand some of our deer conservation history. And after nearly 60 years working in the field, he'll share some thoughts on what responsible, his view of what responsible deer conservation is. It's all yours, Keith. I'm going to talk about what I consider responsible deer management. My focus beyond this, because I've spent my career really seeking to balance the interests, all the stakeholders' interests in the deer herd while respecting ecological imperatives when it comes to proper herd size and manageability. In a way of background, Wisconsin had a model deer management program that came together in 1962. It had, first of all, in-person registration of deer. That actually began in 1953, which was an auspicious year to have it start because that year, fewer than 20,000 deer were shot statewide. So you can imagine how protective hunters were of the deer herd at that time. So in the first year of registration, compliance was nearly perfect. And it seemed as though that had carried forward. It became a cultural tradition going forward. It, it, with that cultural tradition, it'd be nice to have kept it going. Um, unsuccessful hunters very often would show up these registration stations to see how the hunt was going. So you had both the successful hunters and unsuccessful hunters being there. It was like a tailgating party. Secondly, Wisconsin had ecologically based deer management units. Uh, these evolved during the 1950s and were put in place in 1959. And all deer biological data thereafter was recorded by deer management unit. Third, we had a population monitoring system. The sex age kill population model was adapted from a study in Michigan and put in place in 1962. Fourth, they had overwinter deer population goals for each management unit, a target for management. And this was based on herd performance in each of those units. And fifth, the Wisconsin legislature, I think it was in 1961, authorized unit-specific analyst quotas. This was also known as the variable quota system, and it actually started in the fall of 1963. After some years of experience, other state departments became increasingly envious of Wisconsin because Wisconsin could prescribe harvest by deer management unit with predictable results. But controversies leading up to 2010 led to some major changes. I feel the controversy started really in 1986 with some population goal changes in East Central Wisconsin. There were 16 deer management units in the vicinity of Green Bay extending down towards Lake Winnebago, but the population goals were changed from 20 to 25 deer per square mile to 30 and 35 deer per square mile. And it didn't take long for the department to realize they couldn't manage herds at that level with traditional seasons. So they instituted Ernabuck in 1996 that required a hunter to shoot an animalist deer before he could shoot a buck. We also had some T-zone hunting, which was very liberal animalist hunting with an animalist season in October and December and during 
well, you could buy analyst tags, I think, in one year, $2 a piece, and they were unlimited. Well, these efforts at herd reduction over there resulted in a fair amount of herd re hunter resentment. Well, compounding that resentment was a deer eruption that took place in northern Wisconsin above Highway 64. Deer population more than doubled from 1988 to the year 2000. There's a record sequence of mild winters and widespread baiting and feeding that fed that change. The department was clearly in a herd control or herd reduction mode at that time. And that was uh, resented by some hunters. They questioned the deer population estimates that justified such high quotas. Making things worse was the discovery of CWD in southwest Wisconsin because the initial reaction in 2002 was to reduce that herd, cut down on the rate of spread, and hopefully discourage sick deer from migrating out of the infected area to uninfected areas. So this led to pretty much statewide hunter unrest. Well, a candidate for governor picked up on this unrest and promised that if he were elected, he would conduct a review of the program. Well, he was indeed elected in 2010. He appointed a deer trustee from Texas to come up and review the program. And the trustee and a couple of other partners came up and they reviewed the program, conducted a bunch of public meetings, and then produced a deer trustee report in 2012 that contained 82 recommendations. Contrast that with six previous outside reviews in previous decades, where the reviewers pretty much endorsed the program as they found it. Well, prior to implementation, groups were invited to review the Deer Trustee Report. One of these groups is a science and research action team that was made up of biologists and science, scientists from both DNR and the University of Wisconsin. And they came back with recommending that four elements be preserved. Paramount of the, among these was the in-person checking of deer. They realized that there's no way to duplicate the data gathering power, the precision and veracity of having 600,000 hunters run into the woods, collect specimens, bring them out to centralized locations where they can be counted by sex, age, and their condition, health status, and location of kill. You can't match that with more DNR boots on the ground. You can't match that with questionnaire surveys. Secondly, they recommended preserving deer management units as they existed in 2013. These were ecologically based, plus they had a 50 year history of uh, herd performance in each of those units, which is really necessary for planning the next harvest. Third, they recommended keeping quantitative deer density goals by unit. There is really no great mystery of what an appropriate goal is in these units. We've got a 50 year history for context and some uh, that we had uh, estimates of carrying capacity for the forested units. Fourth, they recommended continued use of the sex age kill population model with this proven history of performance. Now all of these science research recommendations were disregarded by the administration except keeping the six H kill. One of the members of the Natural Research Board uh, stood up and insisted that they continue to use that until a better method was proven. And here we are more than a decade later, and we find that a better method has not been proven. But dismantling much of the program is pretty well completed by 2014. Already in 2011, the legislature had prohibited Ernebach supplemental October seasons in any thought of opening the traditional Thanksgiving hunt earlier. Secondly, telecheck supplanted in-person checking of harvest. The cultural tradition ended, as did the tailgating parties, and obtaining deer ages had to be changed. Now, telecheck compliance statewide appears to be acceptable. The compliance and veracity of reporting at the unit level remains in question. Third, Deer management units became counties. Now, a single quota countywide often doesn't fit. In fact, I can use my county Oneida as an example. The middle of the county, old units 36, 37, and 52, is a veritable deer pa uh, factory. But the unit on the, on the west, the Willer unit, and the unit on the east, the consolidated block, had a much higher proportion of wetland for habitat. Carrying capacity is much lower and herd responses are much slower. Well, the temptation 
of, of the County Deer Advisory Council is to kind of hold back and wait for the East and the West to catch up. Well, that's not going to happen. And the result is a loss of harvest opportunity countywide. Fourth, overwinter deer density goals became instead to increase, decrease, or maintain the herd. That was based pretty much on qualitative opinion. There's no substitute for a numeric goal based on biology and experience. The result of the recent management is general overabundance throughout the state. North of Highway 64 in the Northern Forest, 15 of the 18 counties have deer populations that are above what I call a subcultural threshold. It's gonna be difficult to reliably regenerate desired timber species. When you get South Highway 64, the farmland units are virtually beyond control. They are producing more deer than hunters are willing or able to shoot under the current legislative constraints. My hope is that it's time to take a second look at key elements of the management program as, as, it, as it existed prior to the trustee report. Recommendations of Wisconsin Green Fire and the opportunities now publication just out are to revive biology in deer management, to move from the qualitative subjective opinion-based system back to a quantitative objective and science-based program that was also highly transparent. We also urge some necessary legislative changes, and we look forward to the formulation of a long-term deer management plan by the DNR. Thanks for listening. Well, thank you, Keith. Um, and our next presenter is Dr. Don Waller, and Don will be reminding us of the intimate connection that deer have with, forest, with the forest environment that they live in. Take it away, Don. Thanks, Tom, and thanks, Keith. Uh, Keith has always been a hero to me for the way he puts science ahead of politics in terms of deer. Not always easy. Uh, next slide. I wanted to quickly go over the history of why deer densities have gotten to be so high, but Keith has already done a nice job there, so I'll cut that short. I'll focus instead on the impacts that deer have ecologically. Uh, both on uh, forestry regeneration and understory plants, and then more broadly uh, on our lives. Uh, I'd also touch on how we monitor deer impacts, because in addition to monitoring the deer herd, I feel as though we need a more systematic approach to monitoring deer impacts throughout the state. I'll leave uh, this third question of how can we fix what's broken with deer management for the discussion. Next slide, yeah. So you can see that Wisconsin's not alone in seeing this big increase in uh, deer abundance or in recent decades. In fact, it's been a phenomenon across the upper, uh, across the Midwest and Northeast and Eastern uh, US and even in the many other parts of the world, including Europe and uh, places in the Southern hemisphere. So why have deer populations increased so much? Next slide. Well, although Leopold taught us that the way to manage wildlife is to manage habitat, um, in particular, many game species like uh, grouse and deer benefit from early successional openings and edge habitat. Regular logging, especially of aspen, contributes to favorable habitats in the uh, forested parts of the state, as does cutting wildlife openings and leaving logging tops uh, for browse, the highest density of deer scout I've ever counted is adjacent to where there's been some of these uh, tops left. But as Keith mentioned, there's also been a lot of supplemental feeding uh, in the north. We've had mild winters. And of course, we have to mention that predators in general have been scarce in terms of cougar wolves and human hunting being strictly regulated. That hunting ever since the beginning of the 20th century has done um, has emphasized buck hunting over doe hunting. I've subscribed to deer magazines and I live in vain for the, the issue that comes with a doe on the cover instead of a buck, but I haven't seen it yet. Next slide. So this is a cartoon of uh, what things used to be like and what they're like now. Before European settlement, we had a more or less continuous forest, a lot of mature forest that left the shaded understories relatively sparse in terms of deer food, uh, 
Uh, predators, in contrast, were common, both Native Americans and wolves and uh, others. So no surprise, we had a much lower deer density than we do now. But uh, if we look at the lower tier there, you can see that this massive management of habitat uh, with feeding in mild winters, scarcer predators, and uh, regulated hunting have all contributed to the high densities of deer that we have now. And that last arrow on the bottom right is what I want to turn to next, the consequences of that, that high deer herd. Next. Uh, we know that deer are part of a, an ecosystem. They depend on their habitats and affect those habitats in turn. Their habitats traditionally have included predators that have helped keep deer populations in check, uh, both by modifying directly deer numbers and by modifying deer behavior. Deer eat seven or eight pounds of plant food a day. Uh, when they don't have um, wild plants to eat, of course, and in many cases, even when they do, they're happy to eat agricultural crops. The agricultural damage is back in 20, more than 20 years ago, is estimated to be $28 million per year in Wisconsin. Many uh, farmers get uh, nuisance permits to try and shoot deer. I've research is concerned uh, the, about the impacts that deer have had by consuming understory plants, including tree seedlings, particularly conifers, northern white cedar and white pine and deciduous trees like yellow birch and red oak. One of the surprising findings to me of our research was looking at uh, 50 to 60 year changes across Wisconsin, the largest declines in plant understory plant diversity we saw in the state were in three state parks that all lost more than half their plant diversity in the last 55 years. I mean, these are areas specifically set aside to protect diversity if they lost the most. And of course, they were prohibiting hunting for many years, no longer, I'm happy to say. In contrast, we were interested to see that there have been no net declines in plant diversity in the larger Indian reservations in the state, including the Couture and Lac de Flambeau and uh, Menominee. Next slide. So, oh, that slide didn't come through, did it? Um, what that was meant to show on the upper left was how, how in a recent study, we looked at the estimates of deer density in four successive decades and consequent associated uh, numbers of trees, saplings, and uh, as by the forest services, forest inventory and analysis program. And we found cumulative uh, effects accumulating over these decades. You can see in the upper right that Florence County is showing high rates of failed regeneration. In Southern Wisconsin, we've got a graph also from the DNR showing reductions in numbers of saplings in red oak. Uh, and uh, friend Dave Clausen, former chair of the DNR board, has shared this picture of a bonsai red oak from his land in Polk County. Next slide. In uh, this study um, that I did with a student, uh, Bradshaw, we found that, again, using FIA Forest Service data, yellow birch and hemlock, northern red cedar, white pine, and red oak were all suffering heavy browsing throughout the region. This is 14,000 plots. This is not a local effect. It's not specific to one or a few species or one or a few years. This is chronic, pervasive, and long-lasting impacts on the composition and diversity of our future forests. In contrast, the less preferred tree species like those at the bottom, in particular spruce and fir, with maples kind of being in between, show that our forests are shifting in their composition. And we're, as Keith pointed out, we're above silvicultural thresholds in many of our northern counties. Next slide. So what are we losing in terms of other species in northern forests? Essentially, it's the pretty wildflowers, uh, the bluebells and the blue bead lily and the uh, dwarf cornus, uh, dwarf dogwood there, the wild strawberries, uh, lilies, orchids, lobeliads. It's the sedges and the grasses and the ferns that are increasing in contrast. Next slide. What this means for the future of Wisconsin forests is that we're going to have an understory that's depauperate as it is already in large areas in northern Wisconsin. Fewer tree seedlings and saplings to provide cover for the birds that nest and forage in the forest understory. Eventually, if this continues, we could reach a situation like where we see on the Allegheny Plateau in Pennsylvania, 
where chronic high densities of deer have essentially eliminated tree regeneration. The forest canopy is beginning to break up into a savanna, and the understory is so dominated by hay scented and other ferns and grasses that they, they call them fern parks. I, I, I present this as a dystopia. Next slide. So one of my uh, efforts in recent years has been to try to come up with ways to improve our ability to monitor uh, deer impacts. The F relying on one inch saplings that show up in the Forest Service FIA monitoring is giving us a lagging indicator of what trees uh, were eliminated in recent decades. I'd rather look forward. So I begin to measure in understory trees the time since last bite. Um, so how long can a twig grow in the understory before it gets bitten off? Uh, and the broader point I'm trying to make here is that we may want to base deer management more broadly, not only on monitoring deer populations and condition, ideally, but also on the impacts that the deer are having on their own habitats. Next slide. Deer, of course, don't just affect understory plants and tree regeneration, although those are hugely important and I don't want to minimize them. Um, as uh, Keith again has made clear, uh, the more dense your deer are in the landscape, the more uh, accidents you can expect to have with deer. Deer vehicle collisions uh, cost something like 9.3 billion nationally in 2015, 10,000 injured, 150 killed a year. We have about 40 or 50,000 collisions a year here in Wisconsin and the other Midwestern states. It's been estimated that if we actually were able to meet post hunt goal densities, we could reduce those uh, accident losses by 23 million a year. So like that ag loss uh, figure, this is a huge economic burden that are being borne by all the citizens of the state of Wisconsin uh, to essentially support a, a high deer density that only a minority of uh, people are, are favoring. This summer, we actually had a very, another very interesting study pop out that uh, the existence of wolves here in Wisconsin actually makes roadways safer, probably by changing behavior as well as densities. So again, we have a big economic concern to wolf uh, conservation. Next slide. Uh, we're also beginning to see the emergence of many tick-borne diseases. Lyme disease was the big one of the last 20 years, but we also have ehrlichiosis, babesiosis, tick fever, and so forth, all spread by the black-legged or deer tick, uh, which is uh, tending, and you can see in the bottom right, to increase in abundance along with uh, deer densities uh, to the point where some Eastern um, states and uh, towns have taken that aggressive reductions in deer density and efforts to reduce the, the tick abundance and the Lyme burden. Those effects have been, uh, those efforts have been effective in a couple of key uh, cases. Here in Wisconsin, we continue to see increases uh, in Lyme disease. And now, of course, we face the recent discovery that COVID, SARS-CoV-2, uh, is also uh, being harbored in deer from work in Iowa and Michigan. Surely that must be true here in Wisconsin as well. Next slide. So management has got a, a crisis on its hand. Uh, in fact, several crises. Uh, we have not just epidemics uh, of disease occurring, uh, wildlife diseases like you know, we hear about next with chronic wasting and so forth and human diseases, but we're also having chronic impacts on understory plants. Those Band-Aid solutions of repellents and fencing and so forth don't really address the underlying uh, cause of these impacts. And likewise, if we base deer management on county deer uh, advisory committees, we're not likely to hear a lot from Lyme sufferers and victims of accidents and people concerned about broader conservation issues in the state. Last slide, I think, is coming up here. Uh, that was my last slide. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Don. Um, and now we turn to Dr. Mike Samuel uh, and focus on chronic wasting disease and this is really timely as our 20th anniversary of having first detected uh, CWD in Wisconsin is coming up in, in February of, of next year. Take her away, Mike. Okay, can I have the first slide? Yes. So um, 
Recently, uh, CWD has been uh, considered one of the top 10 conservation issues uh, throughout North America. And certainly um, it's prevalent here in Wisconsin. I'm gonna give an overview about what CWD um, today and talk about things we might consider doing in Wisconsin. Next slide. So there are several characteristics of chronic wasting disease that make it both challenging to understand and especially challenging to try to manage. One is it is, a, it's called a prion. It's basically just a misfolded protein. Um, it's not a virus, it's not a bacteria that operates similar to other infectious agents do. It affects um, deer, elk, moose, and caribou here in North America. Um, although it has not affected caribou, it's affected their ecological equivalent reindeer um, in Northern Europe. So at this point, it hasn't reached to areas where caribou are found. Um, it's progressively a neurological degenerative disease that eventually gets into the misfolded proteins, eventually get into the brain because uh, spongy holes in the brain, which eventually leads to death of all the infected animals. One of its characteristics that's a bit unusual is a contagious prion disease, which means it can be spread amongst individuals or it can be transmitted also through the environment. Um, so contact between deer, which are very social animals, is a, a very strong, uh, important way of transmission, as well as through the environment. It has a long incubation period of consisting of typically at least a couple of years. So deer become infected um, and then don't, uh, then don't die until a, typically a couple of years after that infection occurs. And in, from the environmental perspective, it's also highly resistant to degradation. Typically, the way to get rid of it um, in carcasses and other tissues is to incinerate it at at least a 1,000 degrees centigrade. Next slide. So the current distribution, uh, this is a map of the current distribution of CWD in Wisconsin. You can see that it's spread uh, at this point throughout um, larger portions of the state. It's now been found. And originally, it was only found in some small areas of these red, reddish areas um, in uh, southern Wisconsin and uh, southern Wisconsin and northern Illinois on the eastern part of the state. So it's spread extensively in the past 20 years um, to occur now both um, near to these initial outbreaks, plus also in areas throughout the state. Next slide. So the routes of transmission, um, one of the major routes of transmission is by body fluids, saliva and urine and feces are all infect infectious materials. So saliva being probably the one of the most infectious of those materials. And because deer uh, interact with each other, that's probably the major route of transmission between individuals. It also produces environmental contamination from carcasses that are infected and also some from saliva urine and feces as well. It, it accumulates and can accumulate in hot spots in the environment, for example, mineral licks, um, baiting and feeding sites where deer congregate, uh, potentially in scrapes where bucks urinate um, and, the, and that's uh, then exposed, exposes other individuals. Also concentrated food sources may be a way that's spread through the environment. And uh, deer eat about a cup of soil every day. And so uh, accumulation in the soil can be a, an important way that transmission occurs through the environment as well. Recent studies have shown that it can, uh, prions can be uptake by plants but in the laboratory, but so far that hasn't been demonstrated in the field, um, and it, but it's a major concern for the future. The, one of the, the major um, uncertainties at this point is the magnitude of both the direct or animal to animal transmission and environmental transmission is not at all uh, well understood in free, our wild deer populations. Next slide. Next slide, if we can do that. Okay, thanks. So uh, which of the deer are at risk? So infection depends on age of the deer, on its sex, and local pre prevalence of the disease um, where you live, basically where the deer live. So this first uh, uh, graph on the right basically shows that prevalence increases as deer become older. 
Um, and, and this is pretty typical of a, a disease um, where exposure uh, uh, accumulates over time the disease. Also, we've uh, this the graph um, on the on the lower right um, illustrates that males have twice as much prevalence as females, um, which is a, a characteristic of the disease not only in white-tailed deer but also in mule deer as well. And then, as I mentioned, if you live in an area where other deer have higher prevalence, it's more likely that you're likely to, you're going to be infected as well. Next slide. So what are the consequences of this infection to our deer herd? Well, our, our studies indicate that male deer are three to four times more likely to become infected um, than female deer are. And it affects their average longevity or how much longer they're likely to live post-infection. So for example, for a healthy buck that's not infected with CWD, if you you out there hunting um, in the next week or so, and you see one that you're not able to shoot, um, it's fairly likely that that deer is gonna live yet another year, meaning it's gonna come back next year for a potential harvest opportunity with probably a bigger body and bigger antlers. If that deer is infected, however, it's li only likely to have an average long longevity of another four months. So your odds of seeing that deer again next year are basically not good at all, um, probably not very likely. The, the F shot of that is as prevalence particularly becomes higher in our deer, we're gonna see fewer bucks and we're gonna see younger bucks because of the infection rates and the mortality that occurs. Next slide. What about with the consequences for does? Well, the average longevity for a doe is about two more years or for a healthy doe is about two more years. So she's got a really good opportunity to produce a couple more sets of fawns which of course is going to increase uh, her density, which has uh, some negative impacts as, as both Keith and Don have already talked about. If that doe is infected with CWD, however, her average longevity is only about six months more. So there's going to be a loss of reproduction and recruitment to the deer herds, particularly as prevalence um, becomes increasingly important in, these, uh, in, in our does. Next slide. So another characteristic of this disease is that prevalence tends to take on an exponential growth. So this shows uh, exponential growth of chronic wasting disease prevalence in adult males and females, the blue and the solid blue and gold, but also in yearlings, yearling males and females as well in the uh, dashed lines um, uh, in this graph. Um, what you can see is that once prevalence gets beyond about the 5 to 10 percent range in the population, it has a very rapid uh, growth spurt. Um, and so the, it, ideally, we would like to keep it in the range of 5 or 10 percent or even lower if possible to, um, to, not, to not have such a high impact on our, our deer population. Next slide. So um, how does CWD spread? Well, um, we know that yearling bucks, for example, are programmed to disperse uh, across the landscape. Primarily, we think to avoid inbreeding with their, um, the females in their neighborhood who they're related to. But uh, what you can see here on, this, uh, on the graph, particularly on the left-hand side, the um, prevalence over time in uh, yearling bucks. And what happens as the prevalence in the herd grows, the prevalence in yearling bucks grows as well. It grows proportionally. And so these yearling bucks, as they become more and more likely to be infected, um, as prevalence increases, then they're more likely to spread CWD across the landscape. So the, um, the spread increases over time or basically as prevalence increases. Next slide. So what are the implications that we have for our deer herd and the possibility of managing that deer population? I think it's very clear that once the CWD has become established, it's, it's pretty much here to stay. We're going to have to learn to live with it, which hopefully means being able to manage it at low, prep, low enough prevalences that it's not interfering with our herd, uh, herd size and our hunting abilities. So as prevalence increases, um, it's probably going to have big, bigger implications or impacts on our population abundance. Um, and this is because uh, 
the fat fatality uh, occurs uh, with the CWD infected deer within a couple of years or less. The impacts for, the, for CWD are gonna be highest in adult males because they have the highest infection rate, which is gonna lead us to a younger age distribution and fewer trophy deer as we reach high prevalences. The impacts are also high in adult females, particularly when we get to a, a, a prevalence threshold of about 25 to 30% of the adult females being infected because then it's going to uh, decrease reproduction significantly and begin to see population declines in our deer herd, which has happened throughout the West in terms of in, in areas where they have high um, prevalence as well, which is gonna cause us to either have lower harvest or to reduce our harvest so that we can protect the population levels. And the other thing is um, as, these, as these things increase, as prevalence increases, spread is gonna increase as well. Next slide. So what are some of the actions that we could take to try to um, offset some of these uh, problems or eventual problems that are gonna happen with CWD? So um, new areas of infection or areas where we detect um, new disease are probably about the only area where we have an ability to try to um, eliminate the disease. And that's gonna take a very aggressive removal of deer to try to get rid of disease in that local area. To control prevalence, we need to reduce the reduce prevalence to about five to 10%. Um, and that reduces the rate of new infections. And probably the most effective way to do that is to reduce the population of adult males, which have the highest prevalence. And then to control uh, spread of disease, we can reduce prevalence because that will reduce the number of yearlings that are infected that are dispersing, but we can also reduce um, population levels. Next slide. So um, I think that we, our decision is that we're, are we gonna um, be able to manage CWD or attempt to manage CWD? And if not, CWD is gonna uh, manage our deer population for us. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, well, our authors have given us a lot to think about, but we're glad that uh, batting cleanup, uh, we've got Noah Wishaw who's agreed to share a hunter's perspective on deer conservation challenges, and it's his personal perspective. Take her away, Noah. Thanks, Tom. Um, yeah, I, when we first got together to do this, uh, there was some talk of, I guess, listing me as an expert. I'm certainly not that. As uh, Tom said, these are just my personal opinions as to um, what we can do or what the hunters need to do in this state um, in order to I guess, help protect the, the deer herd. Um, as noted in the um, pamphlet that Kingfire put out, hunter numbers across the state are going down. Um, this isn't just a statewide trend, this is a na nationwide trend. Um, and the reasons for that, if we go to the next slide, I think there's, a, there's multiple reasons for that. One is the traditional sources of hunters are declining. Um, the traditional source of new hunters are, I guess, children of old hunters. Um, and that's just not a sustainable model. Um, I guess in my own in my own hunting party, we have four hunters hunting right now. And out of the four of us, there are four, we have four children. That means we have to be perfect in order just to keep the every one of our kids needs to take up hunting in order just to keep the hunter numbers at exactly the same level. Um, that's just not sustainable because it's as everybody knows, you're not always going to be, not every kid is going to want to hunt. Um, so we got to find new sources for hunters. Um, and there's things that are, I guess, keeping us from doing that is it's hard to, you know, I, I have here a lack of access to hunting properties. Um, BHA, like I said, is very focused on making sure that there is accessible hunting properties for everybody um, in the form of public lands. Um, through the Knowles Nelson Act, uh, stewardship funds on uh, the land and water conservation program. There are a number of issues here um, that making sure that people not only have access to these lands, but that they know about these lands. Um, and that it's not just, if you don't have permission to hunt somewhere or own a piece of property, you're not cut off from hunting. Um, the second one is lack of access to mentors. Um, like I said before, we are in a situation where 
my mentor for hunting was my dad. I had that. And that's the reason I'm a hunter is because he was there to teach me to how to do it. Well, for a lot of hunters, we have that. But for a lot of people who don't currently hunt, they don't have that. Um, the R3 programs that are put on through DNR, um, back, BHA has, um, has and will continue to participate in the net. Um, getting, it's important not only to have youth hunts, but also to have hunts for, I guess, adults who are interested in learning the hunts. Um, really, that comes into play because they're, the adults that you teach to hunt are more likely to keep hunting afterwards because they have the resources necessary, be it just the ability to travel um, in order to continue to hunt. So BHA is participating in the um, R3 program that the DNR has and will continue to do so. Our state co-chair was just involved in one on um, this last weekend where his mentee um, shot a nice doe. So those are things that we need to continue to do um, in order to do this. The other thing that is kind of keep, I think keeps new hunters from joining is the high initial investment and just the cost of everything now. Um, hunting equipment like everything has gone up. And I think part of that is our own doing and the, as Ella Leopold referred to him as the gadgeteer, otherwise known as the sporting goods uh, salesman, um, has done a good job. I think a lot of people think that you need to have the high-end equipment, you have to have the full Sitka uh, hunting, uh, you know, uh, bibs and coat in order to go out and hunt. And that's just simply not true. And I think it's important that new hunters know that. You know, what you need to, need to be able to hunt is to be able to go through and sit still for a long time. As long as you're warm and you can sit still, you're, gonna, you're likely to see deer. Um, so I think we need to overcome that a little bit as uh, a, hunting, a hunting group. Um, if we go to the next slide, I guess here's where I think our, the hunter's role really is. Um, in moving forward here is we need to listen to the people like Don and Tom and Keith and Mike and the things they just said. Um, I have here a quote from Jim Posowitz, uh, basically talking about our, the hunting tradition coming down to us. And it's important that we know our history and we know the history of the conservation movement in this country because a hundred years ago, we weren't talking about the overabundance of deer being a problem. We were talking about the fact that there weren't any deer and there weren't any turkeys and there weren't any, you know, the ducks were on the decline and people stepped up at those times in order to put us in a situation now where one of the biggest problems we have looking forward is the overabundance of deer. Of course, you know, when you're listening to the guys you just talked. Um, if we go to the next slide, that, I have here a couple of quotes that, um, kind of outline that show where we were and what we're doing um, and the issues that we have as hunters when it comes to listening to the guys that have just spoken. Uh, the first one, both of them basically boil down to, it's easy, you know, in the first quotes, um, they need to get out of there sitting in their easy, easy chairs, theorizing and thinking up a new way of tormenting and confusing people in the state. This, um, and the second you have that, you have the gentleman saying, um, have them stay in their labs and wear their white jackets and shut up, let the people who live with deer make decisions based on what to do. If we can go to the next slide, please. Look at the dates from those two statements. The first one was from a newspaper article or a letter to the editor in 1917, bemoaning the fact basically that for the two years prior, the state had had a one buck rule, um, meaning that you could only, each hunter was, could only shoot one buck for the year as opposed to the two years that it had in prior to that. Just, and that, by 1925, Wisconsin had its first full season on deer. And then we went to an every other year situation because there just weren't any deer. The second quote is from Ted Nugent two years ago. Basically the same quote. We need to understand that hunters have always been, we've always been very, hesitant to listen to people who we don't think know as much as us and don't think that, you know, well, that guy's in the woods with me, so he's not seeing what I see. And it's, so then it's easy to dismiss them. And it's easy to think that for just some guys in medicine who are talking, look at the guys who just talked. None of them are guys who haven't spent their lives in the woods. 
And we need to understand that as hunters and listen to them because otherwise we're going to end up in the situation where hunters of this state were in 1925 where we don't have a season anymore. And maybe next year you can go hunting, but this year we're not going to have a season. So if we can go to the next slide. This, this continues. I, like I said, in 1925, they went to an every other year um, hunting season. And now, um, they're talk then when they went away from that, they say the experts argue that the only way to save deer from starvation is to kill them off. And quote four is, so let me get this straight. The only way to save deer is to kill all the deer. The DNR is nuts. And we go to the next slide. Quote three was from 1943 when basically the DNR was, or the, at that time, the commission was saying, we need to start shooting some does because they're getting overabundant and they're dying off in the deer yards. And guys like Elbow Leopold were taking the press up there and taking the commission up there and saying, we need to start shooting more deer than we're shooting. Quote four is, just about every hunter I hung out with in the, at the Riverhouse Tavern in Waterford back in 2004 and 2005 when we were in the middle of when CWD was first founded. And, you know, we're seeing stuff coming out of the eradication zone. Well, they're all crazy. The only way to, the only way to save deer is to kill them. Well, now we see what happens. We backed off of that. And we've seen the slides of what's going on with CWD in those parts of the state. Not that we have to kill off every deer, but we're now at a situation where we have a majority of hunters in the state who don't see CWD as the threat that it is. So if we don't start listening to people or start listening to the experts or keep listening to the experts and realizing that because we've listened to the experts throughout our history, we've gotten the opportunities that we need to have. We're going to continue to commit the, I guess, same mistakes that we've committed in the past and run into issues that none of us want to see. That's all I have. Well, thanks, Noah, for sharing those thoughts with us. So our, our wildlife working group didn't want to just put out a publication that left you all hanging with the challenges without offering some concrete recommendations that we thought would, would help put all of us in a better place. And so the next few slides um, give the details of those, those recommendations. Um, we begin by recommending that deer, deer conservation is done best by taking the long view. We need a long-term strategic plan in Wisconsin. And that plan should be informed by an update uh, to the 1995 environmental assessment for deer population goals and harvest management. Science has progressed a great deal in the last 27 years, and we must uh, recognize that, that deer herd is, is tied to the habitats that they live in. Our deer management units should align with the ecological landscape. And Sarah will take the next one. Thanks, Tom. So as we heard from Mike, CWD um, is a serious threat to the deer herd in Wisconsin, and the prognosis is really bad if we stay on the current course. And um, in our Opportunities Now paper, we um, outlined our support for efforts to reduce disease pre prevalence and slow the spread of CWD. And landowners and deer hunters are key to defeating the disease. Uh, we need programs to increase their effectiveness uh, in removing CWD positive animals. And also there are opportunities to remove deer carcasses through disposal sites. I know Jenny Oren, who's helping us with IT, uh, put in a link. We'll talk a little bit more about how you can get involved if you are a hunter on disposing of CWD uh, positive um, carcasses and um, helping remove uh, sick animals um, from the environment. And then also uh, funding for more testing in general is needed across the state so we can under, understand the distribution of the disease. And I'll pass it back to Tom. Thanks, Sarah. Well, um, if hunters are our frontline defense, hunters and landowners, um, well, then we need to be uh, working harder, as Noah indicated, uh, on slowing or stopping the decline in their, their numbers. And to do so, we need a plan to, to guide our efforts. And uh, 
we really encourage the department to move as fast as they can in completing a strategic plan on what they refer to as the R3 um, program, recruitment, retention, and reactivation. We also believe that our legislature has a very important role to play in addressing the conservation challenges. And we recommend that they begin by removing the statutory prohibitions for October firearm seasons and the use of Ernabuck regulations. Sarah? Great, and the uh, final um, uh, or um, last recommendation that we'll mention here right now, and we really encourage you to check out our paper, which we have linked in the chat uh, when you have a moment and you're interested in diving more into this topic. Um, just to mention that deer conservation is not free. Uh, for far too long, we've neglected to invest in it. And in the paper, we talk about recommending a deer conservation stamp where uh, funding can be earmarked for the implementation of a new long-term deer uh, conservation strategic plan. So um, this is one way that we can go about tackling that. So thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, I think we covered a lot of ground. And as I'm sure you've uh, been observing, this is a very complicated issue and there are a lot of factors and variables involved. Um, and so now we're going to be moving into a panelist discussion. We invite you to uh, enter any questions that you have in the Q&A um, function, the little uh, two little bubbles that you see on your screen. We have been collecting those as we move along and we encourage you to add those. Uh, right now I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that you can see everybody's uh, video uh, or, or um, little thumbnail a little bit larger as we get into the conversation. So I am going to kick off um, our uh, um, Q&A here. And um, so I am going to, I'm sorry, I have been uh, running the recording here on my end. So I'm just looking at some of the questions here. Um, we have a question that came from Amy Mueller for Mike. Um, would love to hear about wolves and the possibility, um, uh, their ability to, to de detect CWD in an animal and how they can reduce the spread. And could this be why CWD is a problem in Southern Wisconsin and not in Northern Wisconsin? Uh, I think that's a, real, that's a really interesting and a good question. I think um, we don't have enough real knowledge about how wolves might affect CWD. I think um, people have done some, I would say more theoretical modeling that suggests that wolves have a potential to affect uh, CWD prevalence. Um, if they, for example, have the ability to um, predate on individuals that are sick, um, that would help remove uh, a source of environmental contamination and a source of, of direct transmission to other animals before um, before that would normally occur. So one would suspect they have some impact, um, but I think the amount of the impact is still unknown. I would say that uh, studies in the West where they have abundant um, cougar populations uh, don't seem to have, the cougars do not seem to have major impacts on prevalence of chronic wasting disease, um, although they are certainly selecting for infected individuals. So, but wolves are a very different kind of predators. Um, at, at this point in time, we don't have areas in the country where we have both uh, uh, higher densities of infected deer and wolves to actually get any real data on that. So, but that's a, certainly a good research topic for the future. Thanks, Thanks Mike. Mike. Sarah, I um, see that we have a question that uh, Frank Pratt uh, submitted, and this one maybe direct towards Don, and I guess um, the question, Don, would be, are we trying to carry way more deer than a healthy ecosystem can withstand? Yes, I think the evidence is accumulating that we are um, getting to the point where it's impacting um, the, the long-term sustainability of some of the systems that deer and we rely on. Um, so it's a good question. 
Thanks, John. One for Keith. Um, Keith, uh, Sam Herman Stoffer, I don't know if I got it right, Sam, uh, asked the Erna Buck program was repealed in 2011. In your opinion, what are the positive and negative impacts of this decision today? And do you believe it should be re-implemented into Wisconsin's hunting season? Uh, the answer to the last part is yes. It is the most effective herd reduction tool that we've ever had. And um, without it, I'm not sure how we're going to get on top of deer herds, especially in private, uh, privately held lands. Um, public lands, there's often enough hunting interest and harvest interest that you could reduce herds there fairly well. But uh, in the farm country, it's privately held mostly. Well, back in, in the 50s, farmers had 6.3 million acres of woodlots that they owned. By 2006, that was down to less than a million. So five and a half million acres of, of woodlots changed hands. And I would say a majority of that probably has gone into private uh, recreational owners, many of whom are hunters themselves. And uh, they're interested in maybe in growing their own trophy and are very conservative in shooting deer. And it's difficult to manage deer under that kind of circumstance without earning a book. I got the next question here. So this is a question for all of the panelists and perhaps Noah can start us off though. Um, the question comes from Bruce Neeb and it is, do the presenters feel quality deer management and increased privatization of hunting lands present a barrier to new hunter recruitment? A barrier I think is probably maybe a strong word, obstacle. I think might be the better term. Um, just because, you know, I, I think there is some of that. Uh, people wanting, you know, one, I think new hunters thinking that you need to shoot big bucks in order to be a successful hunter, um, because that's what they're seeing on the magazines and everything else is an issue. The other issue you have, I think is, is there is, the greatest thing in the world as a hunter is to be someplace where nobody else is. And it's almost counterintuitive to then want to get get new get other hunters there and bring them in. Um, so when you you know you have a piece of private land and you're managing it for deer or you're doing whatever it is you're doing, it's hard to then bring in a stranger and, and let them hunt it. Um, you know, it's a property that we hunt, like I said, there's four of us there, and it's there's pressures of you know maybe I do, but the other people that I don't, that I hunt with don't and. You got to make sure that those relationships stay there. So I think that it's it's an obstacle. I don't know that it's a barrier, but yeah. Any other panelists? I would just separate the quality deer management from the privatization of hunting lands. I think they're two different issues. Uh, QDM has um, as paying attention to habitat and age structures and some of what they're doing is good, but I wouldn't endorse them uh, universally. I mean, I think there's some nice things that they, they pay attention to. Some of the, uh, they actually commissioned an, a national effort to, to get numbers on deer. And it seems crazy to me that we don't have any national monitoring system for deer numbers, that the best data now come from QDM, but that's what we have. And I, I think there's a there's a QDM that is the actual organization, and then there's QDM as used as used by hunters throughout. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure which one uh, Bruce is referring to there. Which you know, uh, the organization itself does do good work, as Don just stated. But then QDM, when you talk to other people, it's just managing it for big bucks. When you talk to them, it's just it, it, there's. There's the slang that's used for that used for that too. So I'm not sure what he's referring to. I've been a national stick in the mud when it comes to QDM, probably because I didn't like the term quality, because that implies that there's inferior deer out there. <laughs> um, the other part of it is that it tends to just focus on trophies, despite the fact that QDMA really has a much broader. Uh, application and definition that they'd like to see in place. But as uh, Noah mentioned, when it comes down to the private individual, they're really focusing on trying to produce a 
a big park. And uh, tending to under-harvest the animals here. Supposedly you're supposed to protect the young buck and shoot an adequate number of does. Well, adequate number of does in the harvest is poorly defined by most hunters. They usually underestimate how many deer they have. And this has led to the buildup in deer numbers that we have in private lands. Um, I guess just to add from a chronic wasting disease perspective, having lots of old bucks on the landscape means you're gonna have likely have lots more infected deer and means higher transmission to the rest of the deer herd. So um, at some point, I think there's a, a pretty big conflict between how CWSC um, quality deer management is practiced as Keith points out and um, how it affects chronic wasting disease. We, we've gotten a fair number of questions uh, related to chronic wasting disease, uh, Mike. So I uh, will throw a couple of them um, at you. Um, Chess asks us, um, has CWD been found in any human or domestic animal? And then I've got a couple of other ones that I think are relatively short questions for you. So the, the answer is that it has not been found in humans or, and also not um, in other domestic animals, um, which is a very good thing. Um, it's, there's sort of a, a, a sort of a bigger question here about um, these prion diseases. They tend to be somewhat species specific the proteins. And so the question is, can these proteins do what's called cross the species barrier? Can they go from deer, elk um, in particular, can um, transmit across these, those species? but they don't seem to be able to transmit to other species very readily. But we also don't have very good information about other species of wildlife, for example, that might get exposed um, out, in, out in a natural environment and what might happen to chronic wasting disease if it gets into those animals. So um, I guess I'd say the other thing about CWD in humans is that the I think the scientific, there's, there's some mixed research on how much susceptibility there is in humans to chronic wasting disease prions. And I think the consensus is that the risk is very low to humans, fortunately, but it may not be zero. And so um, there is potential uh, concern for the future. Okay, following up that, um, David asks, do deer infected with CWD still reproduce successfully before they die? Um, I think that's something we have a little bit of information on. The information is a little bit mixed in, let's say, in mule deer and, and white-tailed deer. Um, the one question is, can they sort of produce a fawn? Can they give birth? And I think if they're probably not in the final stages of infection, so probably within the last month or two months of their lives, um, they probably are successful at giving birth. Um, they're probably not as likely to be able to su successfully rear those fawns if they're near, um, near the final stages of disease or what we call the clinical stages of disease where they're actually showing signs of disease. Typically that doesn't occur until the very end, the last month or maybe two months of infection. So they typically can produce um, fawns until they get to that late stage. I guess that's the other reason that typically most hunters who shoot um, what turns out to be an infected animal um, are always surprised. Certainly I was always surprised when we shot infected animals on our property that they look like normal, healthy animals, lots of fat, like lots of very um, nice body condition on them. And you, without the testing, you'd never know that they were actually infected. Thanks, Mike. Next question, and um, Noah, I invite you to dig into this one. So um, this question comes from James. Uh, Today, there is a broad range of values across the hunting and the broader nature-loving communities. 
Um, it often seems like there's an unwillingness to compromise, which often means they meet in court. And um, in your opinion, is it, a po is it possible to seek a greater middle ground or of common definitions and shared values? And um, what can Greenfire and BHA do uh, in Wisconsin to define and promote ethical hunting values? I guess there's two parts to that. Um, I guess for the first question, yes. I think that I'm of the opinion, I guess I compare it to two people getting in a car to go up to the opposite ends of a street. When you're 200 miles away from something, you get in the same car to go, you get to the street and then you can argue about which way you go. So I'm, I'm in favor of whatever we have in common, I think we can at least make kind of cause on that. We, you know, now, and then at the end, we can argue when it comes to, you know, how best to do something, but um, so yes, I think that that's appropriate and should be done. Um, I guess, what was the second question? Yeah, the second question has to do with um, how or what can BHA do in Wisconsin to define and promote ethical hunting values? Is that something that your organization talks about with its members? I guess I'm, that's a tough question to ask. I mean, it's we're for ethical hunting, of course. Um, and then just when it comes to ethical hunting values, I think you know, Leopold talked about ethics being what happens when nobody's around or how you act when nobody's around and hunters, of course, act that way all the time um, or are in that situation all the time where nobody's around to see what they're doing. Uh, so I think what can we do to promote that? It's simply just, I think hunters need to speak out when things are happening that are, are wrong. And it's be good. That's one thing I think we do do a good job of is even in today's society where it's everything has to be black and white and you're either for us or against us, hunters are still people who stand up and say when somebody's poaching or somebody's doing something wrong, say, no, that's not something that we do. And are able to um, differentiate between ethical hunting and lawful hunting versus people who are bending the rules or just, just breaking the rules and say that's not what this is. Great, thanks Noah. Um, this is probably for all panelists, but I'll, I'll throw it out maybe first to um, Keith and um, it kind of gets at the question of, um, I think, how to um, deal both with a, maybe a declining hunter numbers and, and still um, manage the deer herd. So um, it comes from, from Brian, um, who, who indicates that his feeling is, is that, you know, a, a big driver in the shortage of hunters is coming mainly because of um, demographics and, and people having fewer children these days. That's been going on for a while and it'll be a tough one to overcome. Um, but he, in terms of the management part of it, uh, feels that um, there's an opportunity for counties, communities, hunters to partner in a bigger way with uh, area food pantries in an effort to help manage the deer herd as necessary going, going forward. And um, so, if you think about deer herd management, um, Keith, um, is there um, your thoughts on the role of uh, maybe um, incorporating harvest for pantries as, as you know, a, a mechanism for management? I think that opportunity is already there. And I thought um, there was money from permits or something that subsidized the processing of the meat. Uh, coming from the DNR, you'd have to confirm that for me. But um, the declining in numbers of hunters is kind of a scary thing. We've got um, more deer than hunters are willing and able to shoot right now with the legislative constraints. And even if those legislative restraints are relaxed, makes me wonder if there's going to be freezer space enough. And hopefully, hunters will take advantage of more of the food for the hungry type activity. Um, CWD, of course, compounds the problem a little bit because the meat should really be tested before it's turned over. 
and just how that mechanism is going to deter uh, the flow of meat in the food pantries, I'm unaware. Any other panelists got some experience, want to weigh in? Okay. Um, oh, well, I think, Don, you're on mute if you're trying to talk. I was just going to add, I thought it was a great question, Brian. And I, I think we have to think about recruiting non traditional hunters. There's a local foods movement, an organic foods movement. Women are beginning to get into hunting a little bit more. I think your program up at Rhineland, or what I see here, but here it sounds based on city bow hunts and help, helping the recipients or helping out by processing the meat and so on. I think there are a lot of opportunities we should be exploring just like that one. I'd like to see that example spread to other communities. One of, or one of the issues, uh, we talked about ethics just shortly before, and one of the traditional hunter's ethics is you don't shoot what you're not going to use, and you know it's, it's more just pulling the trigger. And that, I think, is a conflict or an issue we have when it comes to getting deer off the landscape and doing those types of things is it's hard to get past, you know, it's hard to get past that where my family uses three or four deer, can use three or four deer a year. And, but once I get past that, then it feels like I'm just shooting them to shoot them. And even if they're going to a food pantry or wherever else they're going, it's just, a, for me personally, it's a mental, it's a mental block that it feels like well, now I'm being not wasteful, but I'm taking more than I should. And I think that is a, that's a conversation that you could have for hours. And I have had for hours with people when it comes to um, a traditional role of the hunter versus the role that we find ourselves in now and what, we're, what we need to do. No one's mentioned the idea of a bounty hunt for deer, but that would change the, the incentives and the economics if people recognize that the state would pay for deer to be harvested where the meat could be shared uh, with people who need it. A question here for Mike. And Mike, you uh, talked briefly about this um, in your talk. Um, acknowledging the emerging studies of deer acting as a vector for COVID-19, how might this change future management strategies? Oh, uh, well, uh, yeah, I think, I think we're, we need to learn a lot more here. We know that um, at this point, we know that deer have become infected with COVID. Um, we don't know how they became infected. It's one would guess it's probably through some environmental route. Um, it appears certainly that deer can pass the disease amongst each other readily, which is not surprising for a highly infectious type disease and the contact that we have amongst deer. Um, the big questions I think are, are really will having, a re having deer as a source of COVID lead to variants that um, might and or the original disease that may go back into people and if so, what's the route for that? Um, I, I think I guess my sort of personal thought is that until we learn a lot more, it's not, and we, and we do need to learn a lot more, but until we do that, um, we probably shouldn't start talking about, um, you know, things that, that, that may not be quite likely yet. So uh, I would urge caution at this point, but also um, uh, certainly some needed research for sure. Thanks, Mike. I think we have time for one more question. I think Tom's queuing that one up. Uh, thanks, uh, Sarah. Well, um, golly. Um, well, we'll go back to Keith. And Keith, um, a, a general question in terms of how does the estimated deer population of today compare to 20 years ago or just Put it into a historical context. Well, in recent years, the fall population has been kind of approaching 2 million deer, which is probably more than we've ever had in 
on Wisconsin, even when all 56,000 square miles was deer range, we're down to 32,000 now as a result of agricultural development and human you know, uh, activity. Um, they have almost 2 million deer in the fall. <laughs> That's a pretty large number. Our goal, when we initially set the goals back in 1962, I say we, when the department did that, Art Dahl was the person that was probably instrumental in setting us up. I think they totaled like 420,000 deer. And those gradually, were, the goals were increased, especially as farmer tolerance was tested in the farm country. The initial goals were set pretty low because at the time in 1962, they knew that the level that was out there at the present time was tolerated, tolerated by farmers. So as they test the farmer tolerance, the goals increased in many cases up to around 25 deer per square mile. And so we had over 700,000 deer as a goal uh, prior to the deer trustee report. But um, the winter population now has been above a million deer. And uh, that's causing some havoc and in their environment. And, we go back to Don Wally and let him talk further. Okay. Um, I think that's the last question we have time to fit in. Sarah? Yes. Thank you. Thank you all. This has been a really enriching discussion. And if we did not get to your question, we apologize. If we have time to address it and it uh, makes sense for our panelists to do that, uh, we'll certainly uh, try and tackle that and send that out to, to everyone. Um, just a, a couple of things. If you are a hunter, we have some ways for you to get involved with helping to prevent the spread of CWD, both with BHA and Wisconsin's Green Fire. Um, with Wisconsin's Green Fire, we have uh, deer dumpsters that are being sponsored, and um, we would love it if you were able to contribute to that. Um, I know Jenny has um, put a link into the chat uh, we have a GoFundMe campaign to help fund those dumpsters to slow CWD. You can also, I think, uh, contribute to those. Um, if you're at the dumpster yourself, I think we have a, a link for you to go in and, and um, uh, help support the cost of those. Um, and then also to mention that BHA has a CWD test incentive raffle. And um, the full details, I believe, can be found in BHA's October uh, newsletter, but um, you can win a couple of different prizes here, and all you have to do is get your deer tested that you've harvested and um, email a confirmation of the test uh, to the address that's listed here. And um, again, this is being recorded, so if you didn't catch it, um, you can refer back to it later. And so um, we really appreciate everyone attending the webinar today. I think we've, we've um, covered a lot of ground, um, everything from CWD to the ecosystem and ecological impacts that deer are having on the landscape, um, a, a historical perspective that Keith brought us, as well as um, the, the future outlook of hunting in Wisconsin, I think, there are many challenges, but also a lot of opportunities for us to consider as we continue to move along. And um, if you have further questions or thoughts, or if you want to get involved, uh, we welcome your membership and participation in both of these organizations and the contact details are here. Uh, with that, we will wrap up the program. Again, if you have friends or colleagues who missed this, we will be making the program available um, on our website at Wisconsin. Uh, wigreenfire.org. So thanks again and um, happy hunting. Um, have a great weekend and uh, wonderful Thanksgiving. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you.